Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Alhamdulillah, this is the 69th session, Sir Nabawiyya alayhi sallatu wassalam. And uh, we've been talking about the Battle of Badr. This is the 10th uh, session on the Battle of Badr. Inshallah next week will be the, or not next week, but the next session will be the last um, talk about Badr, inshallah. And then we'll go on to other events, inshallah. So uh, we've been talking about the Battle of Badr. And last week we talked about uh, one of the ayahs related to the Battle of Badr. Surah Al-Mujadila, ayah number 22, where Allah subhanahu wa says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim. La tajidu qawman yu'minun billah wal yawm al-akhir yawaduna man had Allah wa rasoolah. وَلَوْ كَانُوا آبَاءَهُمْ أَوْ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ أَوْ إِخْوَانَهُمْ أَوْ أَحْشِيرَتَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, You will not find a people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last day, having affection for those who oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if they were their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their kindred. So this is talking about the battle of Badr where Yom al-Furqan, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set the evildoers uh, against the Muslims and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave victory to the Muslims. Now, we talked about last week in relation to this ayah, those people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, that even if there were parents or their own children or their relatives were on kufr and they were on Islam, they had no, uh, they had no um, love uh, for them, meaning not love to them, but they had no... Uh, uh, loyalty to them because of them being kafir, them, them not having iman, uh, that they have the rela- they're related and you know they have the relations, uh, but they do not have any loyalty to those people, and they are ready to give up and even kill those people for the sake of Allah Subhanahu if it comes to it. And we gave some examples. For example, Abu Ubaida ibn Jarrah radiyallahu an. I talk about how his father Al Jarrah, he actually was chasing down his son. So his father being a non-Muslim and his son being Muslim and being one of the Ashar Mubashireen Bil Jannah, uh, the father was actually chasing down the son he, in his anger against Islam, his hatred for Islam and the, hating the fact that his son is Muslim. He was actually chasing him down, trying to kill him. When they finally got face to face, uh, uh, because he was trying to avoid him, he was trying to avoid fighting his father. So Abu Baydar had to defend himself and he actually ended up killing his own father in the battle of Badr. Uh, also, another incident I mentioned was Abu Bakr Siddiq an, and his son Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman later on becomes Muslim, an, uh, but he recalls and he talks to his father. He was talking to his father and he said that, You remember that day of Badr when we were fighting and I was on the side of the kuffar? He said that I saw you many times in front of me and I could have came to fight you, but because you were my father, and out of love for you, I avoided, I, I, look, I went away or I went in another direction. And Abu Bakr Siddiq, he said that uh, if it was for me, if I saw you in front of me, I would have killed you. And this is not because he has hatred for his son or any, he has any problems or beef with his son. It's because his son was on the side of kuffar. He was on the side of kuffar. So because of that, the father is ready to kill his son because of that. Loyalty to Islam not loyalty to blood, okay? And another uh, incident uh, that's related to this is not to the Bayr of Badr itself, um, but there's a famous uh, Sahabi by the name Talha ibn al-Bara al-Ansari radiallahu an. He was famous from the youth of the Sahaba. And ever since the Prophet moved to Medina, had made hijrah to Medina Manawara. Uh, you need a chair? So ever since they moved to Medina Manawara, uh, this uh, Talha radiallahu anh, this young youth, uh, he, mashallah, he uh, stuck to the Prophet He would be with him wherever he could be sitting in the, in the gathering in the company of the Prophet And he really loved the Prophet <laughs> And he would tell the Prophet that I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one day the Prophet testing him, he said, would you even kill your own father? 
meaning because his father was not Muslim. Al-Bara was not Muslim. So Talha radiallahu uh, in acknowledging that yes, he's in ready to kill his own father, he takes a weapon and he starts going towards the direction of his house. He's about to go, basically his intention, I'm gonna go, the Prophet ordered me to kill my father, I'm gonna go kill my father. The Prophet was just testing him. So after a while he called him back, he said, come back, Talha, come back. And he, the Prophet smiled and he laughed and he said, I was testing you. And uh, to see, and this is the, the extreme love he had for the Prophet Again, loyalty to Islam, not loyalty to blood. So Talha, actually going on, uh, he's the one, uh, if you guys remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, about a month ago, I think, Qari Ilyas, uh, he mentioned him in the bayan, uh, in one of the talks. He mentioned that Talha was the boy, he was sick when he was on his deathbed. And uh, the Prophet had come to visit him, and his house was a little bit distance away from Masjid Nabawi. So the Prophet had gone to visit him, and he had seen that he's basically at his final stage of death. He's about to, he's about to pass away. And the Prophet said, if he passes away, then let me know so I can come back and I can read janazah and pray for him. And uh, Talha, uh, being a young teenager at that time, he's, he's about to die, and he says, uh, because he passed, he was about to pass away at night. The Prophet had gone back home, and he tells his family, he tells his mother, or his family, that do not inform the Prophet. And the reasoning behind that, he said that the Prophet's house and my house is a distance in between. It's night time, it's the middle of the night. If he comes now, then maybe someone might try to attack him. Someone might try to, and his life may be in danger because of me. So rather than getting the du'as in the, of the Prophet I would rather not let him know, and he can come visit later or he can find out later. So the Prophet was not informed. They buried him, they did janaz, they buried him. And the Prophet when he found out, he was upset. He said, why didn't you tell me? And he was telling, told the reasoning behind that, that he preferred <laughs> your safety over you coming. And the Prophet went then to the grave, and he raised his hands, he made a beautiful dua. He says, uh, Oh Allah, Allahumma alqi, uh, Allahumma alqa talha wa anta tadhaku ilayh, uh, wa huwa yadhaku ilayk. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, uh, meet talha in such a way that he is smiling at you and you are smiling at him. Meaning that you are pleased with him and he is pleased with you. So this is a beautiful dua he made for Talha Radhiran. Again, he is Talha ibn Al Bara Al Ansari Radhiallahu An. Now, going further, so the Prophet Sallallahu stayed on the battleground of Badr for a total of three days, and this is one of the uh, th- one. Uh, there's many reasons behind this. One is uh, to show your enemy that you are not afraid, and you're basically to uh, to show the stance that I'm here come back if you want to come back and try to fight me come back and and try you know like uh, when we were kids uh you know when you would f- play over in the playground and someone get on the top and you say like you know I'm the king of this thing or whatever and whoever can pull them down as, as fast as they can they have this kind of like a competition kind of thing okay but so at that time uh, the enemy when they are defeated then they ran away the, the people who won, the victors, they would stay in that place to show that this is my spot. I've taken and I've defeated you. If you're ready to come back for a second try, go ahead, you can come. So the Prophet Sallallahu stayed there for a total of three days and they were not able to come back. They were too afraid. They actually ran all the way back to Mecca and not even in formation. They didn't even get together and then travel back together. They actually just, every man for themselves. Okay, and they just got back to Mecca, whoever, one, you know, one at a time or a few at a time, whoever was together. Now the Prophet ﷺ, uh, we know that, so he arrived, the Battle of Badr was the 17th. Okay, the, they arrived the, the night before, and then the 17th, and then the Prophet ﷺ stayed an extra three days. So the 20th of Ramadan, the 20th of Ramadan, they <coughs> set out from Medina. Uh, one of the things that they did in these three days while they're stationed in Badr, was the spoils of war. So they started gathering all the spoils of war. And one of the things that happened was, and, and uh, some people start getting into a little bit of argumentation, saying that, you know, these, the, I, I deserve this much. The young would say, I, would, I deserve this much. The older generation said, I, 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 we deserve it, you know, because of our strength and, and whatnot. So they had this kind of 
uh, disagreement on who can, who's going to get what. Others, for example, in the previous wars um, at that time, basically it's every, every man for themselves. This is talking, I'm talking about before Islam. So anything you could carry is yours after the battle. So thinking the same, and there's no rules of war, no rules. So Anfal was not revealed by then. So the spoils of war, what to do with them, that was not revealed until that time. So there was a disagreement that took place, and Allah SWT, uh, revealed the first ayah of Surah Anfal, where Allah SWT says, "Yes, alunaka anil Anfal," that they ask you about the Anfal, they ask you about the spoils, that you know how should we distribute them, who gets what. Qulil Anfalu lillah wal Rasul, say to them. Oh Muhammad Sallallahu that the unfold, the distribution of the, the spoils is for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do as they wish, and then the rules were uh, given. For example, the khumus and, and stuff, and that's we're not going to go into detail about that. But that was the rules uh, were set uh, on what to do with the spoils. Now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, being the supreme leader, being the leader of the of the Muslims, he has a choice to give some more than others. Uh, but they, he equally distributed amongst the Muslims who were there. And some people, for example, uh, were given the personal effects of the person they killed. So, for example, when we talked about Abu Jahl being killed, remember Mu'adh and Mu'awwad ibn Afra, anhuma, they were the two boys who went and attacked Abu Jahl and actually dealt the, the death blow that he was, he was dying from that. Uh, both of these brothers came and they told the Prophet ﷺ that we have killed Abu Jahl and uh, the Prophet ﷺ looked at their swords and he saw that both of them had blood on them he said both of you killed uh, Abu Jahl and one of them actually did not survive after the battle he was shaheed and that's why the brother was given the, the share the personal effects of of Abu Jahl, his shield for example and whatnot. not uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud was given the sword of Abu Jahl and the sword of Abu Jahl because Abu, Abdullah bin Masud is the one who actually went and killed Abu Jahl. He was breathing his last. He actually killed him and then he uh, took his head and brought it in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, another man, there was another incident uh, that happened during the battle. Zubair ibn Awam uh, killed a man by the name of Ubaidah ibn Sa'id al ibn As. So this Ubaidah ibn Sa'id he was one of the kuffar and he was actually shielded from head to toe, okay? Not even one inch of his body was left open. So from head to toe he was shielded and he only had either one eye or two eye sockets, basically holes open so he can see. Everything else was covered so he can protect himself. Now during the battle, Zubair ibn Awam Radhan took a spear and he threw it at this man and he threw it so hard and again, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى That you did not throw when you threw, but Allah SWT is the one who threw. Uh, Zubair Radha throws the spear and just imagine the chance of that. And this shows that this is help from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He threw the spear across the air and it goes and goes through that small hole and it uh, goes and hits him in the eye and that person was killed by this, uh, by this spear. So this is Zubair ibn Awam Radhan who did this. And uh, when he went and he pulled out the spear from the man's, and this is kind of disgusting, but when he pulled it out, uh, not let alone blood, but the, the, the spear head itself was bent because of, remember again, it had to go through a small hole and it had to you know, get inside to hit him. So it was bent up a little bit because of the extreme force that he threw it with. Uh, so this spear was actually given to Zubair Zubair as part of his spoils and it was actually passed down from generation to generation in his family it was passed down from generation to generation uh, another thing the Prophet ﷺ, he did while they were stationed there at Badr is that he gathered the body, bodies and one hadith is told that 24 of the leaders of Quraysh were all gathered and there was an abandoned well where people would throw garbage and throw you know stuff in there uh, it was there was no water in there so it was abandoned well and they took these 24 bodies and they dumped them in that one well this is called the Qalib al-Badr okay so that well is called Qalib so the Prophet some ordered they threw the 24 bodies uh, the rest of the bodies remember there was 70 total 70 of the leaders of Quraysh were killed so the other bodies were uh, were dumped somewhere else or they were buried somewhere else. And uh, there was one body, do you guys remember who it was that was not buried along with the rest? And 
that was reason, the re, he was buried basically out in the open. They just took some pebbles and 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 uh, stones and and dirt and put it over his body and left his body like that. Anyway, remember who that was? He was a former slave over owner of Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. Was the, the name of the man he used to torture Bilal radiallahu anhu. No, Akbar, no. Umayyah. Umayyah bin Khalaf. Barakallahu feek. So Umayyah bin Khalaf, he was the one who used to torture Bilal radiallahu uh, He came to the Battle of Badr and I spoke about how he didn't want to come and then he was forced into it. So he came to the Battle of Badr and he was a very heavy set man. So when he died and remember they lay there, so in the hot sun, it was, they were there for a while. His body, and this is also again, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his body started to decompose and part of his body got stuck to the ground underneath him. So when they tried to pull him, they couldn't lift his body because he's too heavy. So when they tried to pull his body, um, parts of his flesh started uh, coming off. So they just had to leave his body like that. They just covered it up and they left it like that. So that was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Um, two of the prisoners of war that were caught, so 70 were, uh, kuffar were killed and 70 were caught as prisoners of war. Now out of those 70, only two were executed on the spot. They were executed there on the battlefield of Badr. And this is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt and Nadr ibn Harith. So these are two people who were killed on this, in the battlefield. I mean, after, sorry, after the um, battle was over, prisoners of war, they were executed. And they were the only two. And uh, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt uh, and Nadr ibn Harith, the one commonality between them where they would mock they would mock the Quran and they would mock the Prophet ﷺ. So we know Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, uh, uh, sorry, another, another ibn Harith, he was the one when the ayat of Quran would come and he would say, these are asatir, these are just stories of the past, these are just fables. And uh, he was one of those who had traveled a lot in the world for business and whatnot. So he'd say that I have traveled the world, I've traveled the lands, I know more stories, I know better stories than the, what, the, what Muhammad is telling you. So come sit with me. So whenever the Prophet would try to recite the Quran, he would call the people and he would try to gather them, distract them and he would tell them stories. So he would try to mock the Quran. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, we know he's the one when he became Muslim. Uh, his friend uh, Safan ibn Umayyah, he says that uh, basically, uh, how dare you become Muslim? And he goes... Uh, he tells them to go and spit in the face of the Prophet ﷺ, and he tried to do that. Uh, and then uh, we talk about how he did that, so he tried to do that. Uh, also, he was the one who threw the entrails and the, the disgusting, you know, the leftover and the guts of the, of the camel uh, on the back of the Prophet ﷺ while he was praying. He was also the one who tried to physically strangle the Prophet ﷺ with his clothing from, from behind. He tried to kill the Prophet ﷺ. So this is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uh, he actually, uh, and when he was about to die and they were about to kill him, he actually started begging for his life. And he asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said that, I have children who will take care of my children. And the Prophet ﷺ responds by saying, An-Nar. He says, the fire. Now the ulama talk about this. They say that, uh, um, uh, what does that mean? You know, the fire will take it, care of that. And basically, uh, one of the interpretations is that the Prophet ﷺ is saying that you have the nar to worry about, don't worry about your children. The nar is there, that's, that's ashad, meaning it's something that's more appropriate for you to fe be fear, fearful, fearful, uh, fearful of and be scared of and, 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 and than, the, than your children. Uh, because we know that Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, one of his children, his daughter actually, became Muslim. And that was Umm Kulthum uh, bint uh, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Uh, she became Muslim and she actually uh, kept her Islam hidden for a while, and then in the when the Hudaybiyah, the true the, the truths or the treaty of Hudaybiyah took place, uh, that's when the Prophet and the Muslims were camped at Hudaybiyah, and Umm Kulthum anha was actually the first of the Muhajirat, one of the first of the women who had come after the treaty was signed. She came out, she left, she abandoned Mecca, or she ran away from uh, Mecca, and she went to the Prophet and camped, and that's when she was not sent back. Uh, and that's something we'll talk about why, what happened uh, later on, inshallah. So uh, another thing the Prophet did uh, right before he departed back 
to Medina. So he's uh, on the battlefield of Badr. The third day when they're about to leave, he got on his, um, on his ride and he, uh, the, the Sahaba all got ready and he ordered them, okay, let's go. And when they're about to leave, he turns away from, the, uh, from Medina and he goes and the Sahaba being, you know, Sabina wa Ata'ana, whatever the Prophet says and does, they would follow and they would obey. They followed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ went to the Qali wal Badr. He went to this, even though it was out of the way, but he went there, stopped there specifically for this. And what he did was he stood there and he started calling out name by name the people who had died of the kuffar. So he started calling them by name. And he said, Ya Fulan ibn Fulan, you know, Abu Jahl, you know, Umayyah ibn Khalaf and Utba ibn Rabi, all these people. And he says that, Ayasurukum, uh, that. Uh, don't you wish that you had annakum ata'tum Allah wa rasula? Don't you wish that you would have become Muslim? Don't you wish that you were Muslim now that you see what's what's there? And he says, فَإِنَّ قَدْ وَجَدْنَا مَا وَعَدَنَا رَبُّنَا حَقَّ We have found what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us as true. Did you find what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you as true? Meaning you have seen the adab and the punishment that is waiting for you in the, in the, afterlife, in the afterlife. So uh, at this, when he was call, talking to the dead, basically, Umar bin Khattab he says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Ma tukallimu min adsadin la arwaha laha. That, you know, you're, you're talking to d- dead bodies. They have no ruh. Can, like, can they hear you? Or, you know, uh, you're talking to these dead people. And the Prophet responds by saying that they are able to, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَّدِيهِ مَا أَنْتُمْ بِأَسْمَعَ لِمَا أَقُولُ مِنْهُمْ That I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, they are able to hear as much as you are able to hear me. So the Prophet said this, and then they continue. Uh, I didn't mention also the 14... Uh, actually, sorry, I didn't mention that. So f- before, uh, the 14 shuhada of Badr are also buried there on that site. Uh, they weren't taken back to Medina. They weren't uh, shifted anywhere else. But they were buried where, where on the battleground, basically close to the battleground. So there's the graveyard of the shuhada of Badr uh, over there. So we're going to stop here, inshallah. And uh, next week, we'll, uh, sorry, next session will be the... Um, uh, next week, we're not going to have class. Uh, but next session, inshallah, we'll have the last class of Badr. And then we'll continue on. I'm going to be talking about the, the prisoners of war, what the Prophet did with the rest of the prisoners of war, uh, what the ransom and, and whatnot, inshallah. And then also uh, what happened when they got back to uh, Medina Munawwara. And so we'll also talk about some places where the Prophet stopped uh, on this journey, uh, which are still present today, and you can go and visit those places. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair. Wa akhiru da'ana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين